The following study is going to be an exploration of some of the quotes from the Baha'i Writings related to the unity of religion. In this study we're going to try and take a look at how we can begin to see these apparently disparate faiths, like Judaism or Christianity or Islam and Buddhism, how we can see them as one and begin to look at avenues of approach to unifying them. Dear friends, thank you for joining us. Um, please note that this is only a personal interpretation of the Baha'i teachings. If you wish to have an authoritative stance, please go to Baha'i.org. I want to thank the Baha'i administration, all those working in their neighborhoods, and anyone who is trying to work for the betterment of the world. Please note that in the description below you'll be able to find an MP3 version of this, so you don't have to watch it, um, but also a PDF of all the quotes that will be used in any of the deepenings, and timestamps of the different sections. And please subscribe if you'd like to be alerted for any upcoming videos. So we're going to start here with a series of quotes, three from Baha'u'llah and one from Abdu Baha. All men will adhere to one religion, will have one common faith, will be blended into one race, and become a single people. All will dwell in one common fatherland, which is the planet itself. That which God hath ordained as a sovereign remedy and mightiest instrument for the healing of the world is the union of all its people in one universal cause, one common faith. That which the Lord hath ordained as a sovereign remedy and mightiest instrument for the healing of all the world is the union of all its peoples in one universal cause, one common faith. This can in no wise be achieved except through the power of a skilled and all-powerful and inspired physician. This verily is the truth, and all else naught but error. The purging of such deeply rooted and overwhelming corruptions cannot be effected unless the peoples of the world unite in pursuit of one common aim and embrace one universal faith. So in these quotes, the central figures, in this case Baha'u'llah and Abdu Baha, clearly state that the Baha'i position is that the sovereign remedy for the healing of the ills of this world is the unity of humankind within one common faith, within one universal cause, and that this cannot be achieved save by the hand of the Divine Physician, the manifestation of God, that this is not a purely social interaction just between people, but is given unto us from God through the revelation of Baha'u'llah, and it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that humankind will be united. It also states that we believe that the, quote, purging of such deeply rooted and overwhelming corruptions cannot be achieved unless we come together in the unity of pursuit for one common aim and embrace one universal faith. Now for many individuals, this seems peculiar, and we will actually look at that aspect of it as we move on, that we see that the world itself will actually become united. And as peculiar as this may seem, uh, we have to remember that all of Europe was united under the cause of Christianity. That actually many disparate communities within and around the Empire of Persia were brought together under Zoroastrianism that very many different kinds of beliefs and pursuits and goals and aims are under the umbrella of Hinduism and the transformative power of Buddhism within Asia and Southeast Asia. We also suggest that you take a look at our video on uh, Is the Baha'i Faith a Utopian Vision, which may also help to understand this facet. How sweet and glorious to remember in these days of strife and turmoil how the mighty hand of our beloved Abdu'l-Baha has gathered together people of diverse tongues and distant climes, and united their hearts in one common spirit of love and servitude to the sacred threshold of Baha'u'llah. The spirit that has achieved so great a measure of reconciliation is today the one factor that can, amid the unceasing contentions of races, nations, creeds, and classes, Assure to this disillusioned world the reign of true felicity and peace. 
that it is the Baha'i Faith's teachings that is the one factor that can bring a disillusioned humankind together to finally see the world itself as one motherland, as one real true community, a world in which Yes, we have many chapters, many different chapters to our spiritual history, and many different symbols and expressions of those underlying unities that we can find through investigation and exploration of the different traditions of our world. This next quote is from Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i Faith. Therein lies the strength of the unity of the faith, of the validity of a revelation that claims not to destroy or belittle previous revelations but to connect, unify, and fulfill them. In this quote, Shoghi Effendi states that the Baha'i Faith does not claim to destroy or belittle previous revelations, but to connect, unify, and fulfill them. So it is an expression of integration, not disintegration, of fulfillment, not eradication, of a greater expression in unifying rather than an abrogation of previous dispensations. That, from a Baha'i perspective, the fullness and the beauty and the profundity of, say, Moses was actually manifested within the person of Jesus Christ. That it is actually through the Buddha that we more fully understand the original teachings of Hinduism. That yes, as with Islam, it actually enabled us to have a greater vision and a deeper understanding of the original traditions of Judaism and Christianity. And that each of these gives us light that can actually lead through the darkness when we're studying something like Zoroastrianism, which I believe um, any observer who wishes to study it will see as intimately connected with the revelations both of Judaism and of Christianity. So the following is another quote from the guardian of the Baha'i Faith, Shoghi Effendi, from the World Order of Baha'u'llah. And we're going to break it down into sections so we can see each chunk uh, as a piece. The revelation, of which Baha'u'llah is the source and center, abrogates none of the religions that have preceded it, nor does it attempt, in the slightest degree, to distort their features or to belittle their value. It disclaims any intention of dwarfing any of the prophets of the past, or of whittling down the eternal verity of their teachings. It can, in no wise, conflict with the spirit that animates their claims, nor does it seek to undermine the basis of any man's allegiance to their cause. It's interesting here in this first paragraph of the quote that Shoghi Effendi is saying that the Baha'i Faith does not seek to abrogate, nor distort, nor belittle the value, and does not dwarf any prophets of the past. That it also does not seek to undermine the basis of any man's allegiance to their cause. It's interesting that when you begin to study the Baha'i Faith, what I believe we actually find is if there is any problem in how the Baha'i Faith sees previous messengers of God. Um, that really what is happening is that it is actually, if anything, an overinflation of their station. And this goes even for such individuals such as Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita, or Jesus Christ within the New Testament. That, in a sense, it is giving a fuller expression of the station of them, and I think we will see this in future videos related to Hinduism and Christianity. That it is something that is trying to actually state that the, the kernel, if you will, the seed of Judaism, was actually given greater life within Christianity. That our understanding of the divine and its relationship to humankind was actually expressed to a greater, de greater degree sorry, within the dispensation of Islam. And the same goes for the Baha'i Faith. It's not seeking to abrogate, belittle, or dwarf any, dwarf any prophets of the, fa of the past. Rather, it is actually expressing how they fit into a continuingly progressive revelation of God's will and desires for humankind. And I have to say that this is a claim that, as peculiar as one might see it on the surface, is not one that can be brushed off without investigation. It may not sound like what another individual believes, or what a person, you know, if you will, takes to immediately. But it is only through an investigation, 
the independent investigation of truth, one of the first teachings of the Baha'i Faith, then one can truly assess whether or not the claim is true. It's declared. Its primary purpose is to enable every adherent of these faiths to obtain a fuller understanding of the religion with which he stands identified and to acquire a clearer apprehension of its purpose. It is neither eclectic in the presentation of its truths, nor arrogant in the affirmation of its claims. Its teachings revolve around the fundamental principle that religious truth is not absolute, but relative, that divine revelation is progressive, not final. Unequivocally, and without the least reservation, it proclaims all established religions to be divine in origin, identical in their aims, complementary in their functions, continuous in their purpose, indispensable in their value to mankind. I absolutely love this section of the quote because it actually states that the Baha'i Faith's primary purpose is to enable every adherent of these faiths to obtain a fuller understanding of the religion with which he stands identified and to acquire a clearer apprehension of its purpose. And again, this isn't something that individuals within prior dispensations or prior religions, if you will, uh, should find odd from a even a Jewish perspective. The religion of Moses would have given individuals who had been followers of Abraham or Noah a clear apprehension of the purpose of the original covenant. An expression, for example, within the Old Testament of the revelation given unto Isaiah or, I, or Ezekiel or Micah was to enable an adherent of that tradition itself to have a deeper and more profound understanding of the religion with which they stood identified through a, if you will, a progressive revelation through Isaiah, Ezekiel, or Micah. And I think it's, uh, when I actually hear this, it's like I myself am a musician. So I might, for example, at the beginning of my study, study scales, and I study them in a very particular way, say from the lowest note to the highest note and back down. But it's actually when I learn more about music, and I actually understand a greater degree of that beautiful art, that I find actually a fuller understanding of the purpose of these things. If I'm studying mathematics, I begin, say, purely within a symbolic language when I'm very young. And yet as I grow and develop within my mathematical world, within the mathematical discourses and sciences, I find actually how they can be applied, for example, to the economy, or I find out how they can be applied to physics, I find out how they can be applied to chemistry. And it is through such things that I obtain a fuller understanding of the original mathematical structures, or in the musical case of the scale. Uh, for example, within the martial arts, I might have a specific drill that I'm actually moving through. Yet it is only through a greater picture that I find out how that drill particularly fits into a greater picture. And I think it's the same with religion. As I said, even for the Jewish individual, from a Christian perspective, it is once again the same thing. That yes, there were revelations sent unto Abraham, Moses, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and yet it is only through Christianity that actually one understands and becomes better acquainted with the Jewish scriptures and has a fuller understanding of what their purpose was, what the actual intention was. Um, the same goes for a Muslim. They actually perceive that it is actually through the Quran that they understand more about the dispensation of Jesus Christ, what it was for. I was creating a wider community a community of humankind that will embrace greater and greater degrees of expressions of God's will for humankind. It's that we understand in so many cases that through the stages of learning and even prior moral understanding, that it is actually once we understand a larger picture of the world that we come to see how this teaching of, say, even honesty within the moral world or compassion has so many more expressions and so many other ways to relate to humankind, whether it be honesty and compassion or justice, we see it being fulfilled and manifested in a greater degree. And the same thing goes when you're teaching any individual 
anything, really. <laughs> you start with the basics, you give them an understanding, and then in a sense, you place that within the context of a larger vision of how that relates to the rest of their world. I even suggested before that it is even through uh, the understanding of Buddhism. And when a Buddhist looks at the Hindu scriptures, they believe they understand more deeply the role or the position, for example, of the Hindu pantheon, more about their nature and relationship to the divine world, their relationship to samsara, the role they play within one's ascent to nirvana, or through the stages of the base of infinite space of nothingness, of neither perception or non-perception, these different stages that appear within the Hindu, or sorry, within the Buddhist scriptures. And I think it's the same once again. It is through Buddhism that I understand Hinduism. Now, of course, it is through Hinduism that I understand Buddhism, because that is the context that it's placed within. And again, this will take further study within Buddhism and Hinduism to show, but that it really is meeting people where they are, helping them to understand the nature of the divine realm and the sacred, and enabling them to actually really get a handle on it, and then evolving that understanding. And this is the same whether it be in teaching someone martial arts, sciences, mathematics, music, really anything. All the prophets of God, asserts Baha'u'llah in the Kitab -e Gan, abide in the same tabernacle, soar in the same heaven, are seated upon the same throne, utter the same speech, and proclaim the same faith. From the beginning that hath no beginning, these exponents of the unity of God and channels of his, of his incessant utterance have shed the light of the invisible beauty upon mankind, and will continue, to the end that hath no end, to vouchsafe fresh revelations of his might and additional experiences of his inconceivable glory. To contend that any particular religion is final, that all revelation is ended, that the portals of divine mercy are closed, that from the day springs of eternal holiness no sun shall rise again, that the ocean of everlasting bounty is forever stilled, and that out of the tabernacle of ancient glory the messengers of God have ceased to be made manifest would indeed be nothing less than sheer blasphemy. In this passage, the Shoghi Effendi is quoting Baha'u'llah, and he is stating that from a Baha'i perspective, we see all the prophets of God abiding in the same tabernacle, soaring in the same heaven, seated upon the same throne. That the Word of God, or the will of God, termed the Logos, for example, within the New Testament, is actually manifested through various vehicles, various expressions, various, the Baha'i term is, manifestations, upon the plane of history to tell the story of the sacred, to share with humankind the beauty of the divine friend of ultimate reality. And that this is an eternal covenant between God and humankind started at the beginning of human consciousness, and that these expressions from God will never end. Quote, to contend that any particular religion is final, and I will end that section of the quote, would indeed be nothing less than sheer blasphemy. There's actually very, very few times <laughs> that the, the Baha'i writings ever use this term. But it is that it is going directly against the very nature of what God is. That there is a very large difference between the belief that God will not, as opposed to cannot, reveal his attributes and spread his fragrance unto humankind. That all the, and it's, sorry, it's important to note that all religions actually proclaim a coming revelation, another expression of God's will unto humankind. It's not a matter of whether or not he will, it's rather how he will do so. For example, if it is going to be completely obvious, as many, for example, Christians and Muslims might believe, 
or even Buddhists or Hindus might believe, or whether it's something that actually will necessitate the intellectual, spiritual, and emotional and moral investigation of the adherents to see whether or not this, for example, the Baha'i Faith, is one of those expressions of the Divine Will unto humankind. They differ, explains Baha'u'llah in that same epistle, only in the intensity of their revelation and the comparative potency of their light. And this, not by reason of any inherent incapacity of any one of them to reveal in a fuller measure the glory of the message with which he has been entrusted, but rather because of the immaturity and unpreparedness of the age he lived in to apprehend and absorb the full potentialities latent in that faith. Know of a certainty, explains Baha'u'llah, that in every dispensation the light of divine revelation has been vouchsafed to men in direct proportion to their spiritual capacity. Consider the sun, how feeble its rays the moment it appears above the horizon, how gradually its warmth and potency increase as it approaches its zenith, enabling, meanwhile, all created things to adapt themselves to the growing intensity of its light, how steady it declines until it reaches its setting point. Were it all of a sudden, to manifest the energies latent within it, it would, no doubt, cause injury to all created things. In like manner, if the Son of Truth were suddenly to reveal, at the earliest stages of its manifestation, the full measure of the potencies which the providence of the Almighty has bestowed upon it, the earth of human understanding would waste away and be consumed. For men's hearts would neither sustain the intensity of its revelation, nor be able to mirror forth the radiance of its light. Dismayed and overpowered, they would cease to exist. So in this quote, Baha'u'llah says, and again unequivocally, that the differences that we find amongst the religions of God is that only in their intensity of the revelation and the comparative potency of their light. That it is not because of some, quote, inherent capacity any one of them might lack or possess, but rather because, again, quote, of the immaturity and unpreparedness of the age in which he, the manifestation of God, lived in to apprehend and absorb the full potentialities latent in that faith. That the light of divine revelation has been vouchsafed to men in direct proportion to their spiritual capacity. It is not that actually that which, for example, from a Baha'i perspective, is expressed within the teachings of the Baha'i faith is because of some essential inherent uh, superiority of Baha'u'llah or the Bab, the forerunner of the Baha'i faith, but rather it is the, the, the nature of the divine educator themselves in meeting humankind at the level of their spiritual, moral, and social evolution and seeking to lift them to the degree possible. And this again is the exact same thing that any teacher must do. They must reach out, find, and if you will, diagnose like a divine physician the degree of understanding and capacity of their patient or their student and actually raise them up. To actually share with an individual or a group of people something that is far beyond their capacity would actually be a poor educator or a poor physician. But it's not in the nature of, say, a teacher. For example, my wife is a teacher and she teaches kindergarten. It's not that she couldn't teach grade seven or she couldn't study and express things at the degree, if you will, of college or university. It's that her job is to meet these individuals where they are at and seek to raise them up so that the next teacher can actually spread that further. So the coming of, for example, Baha'u'llah is not a diminution, a lessening of the station or dwarfing of a station of the Prophet Muhammad 
any more than the Prophet Muhammad sought to dwarf or belittle the station of Jesus Christ. Nor, for that example, Christ of Moses nor Moses of Abraham. It is for this reason, and this reason only, that those who have recognized the light of God in this age claim no finality for the revelation with which they stand identified, nor arrogate to the faith they have embraced powers and attributes intrinsic, intrinsically superior to or essentially different from those which have characterized any of the religious systems that preceded it. The revelation of which I am the bearer, Baha'u'llah explicitly declares, is adapted to humanity's spiritual receptiveness and capacity. Otherwise, the light that shines within me can neither wax nor wane. Whatever I manifest is nothing more or less than the measure of the divine glory which God has bidden me reveal. If the light that is now streaming forth upon an increasingly responsive humanity with a radiance that bids fair to eclipse the splendor of such triumphs as the forces of religion have achieved in days past, if the signs and tokens which proclaimed its advent have been, in many respects, unique in the annals of past revelations, if its votaries have evinced traits and qualities unexampled in the spiritual history of mankind, these should be attributed not to a superior merit which the faith of Baha'u'llah as a revelation isolated and alien from any previous dispensation might possess, but rather should be viewed and explained as the inevitable outcome of the forces that have made of this present age an age infinitely more advanced, more receptive, and more insistent to receive an ampler measure of divine guidance than has hitherto been vouchsafed to mankind. So in this passage, again, it is not to arrogate to the faith they have embraced powers intrinsically superior. No Baha'i should actually believe that the Baha'i faith, or Baha'u'llah, or the Bab, actually has intrinsically superior capacities compared to that of Abraham, or that of Moses, or that of Jesus or the Prophet Muhammad, but rather that it is adapted to human spiritual receptiveness and capacity, as we were speaking earlier, and that if it, quote, bids fair to eclipse the splendor of such triumphs as the forces of religion have achieved in the past, it these should be attributed not to a superior merit which the faith of Baha'u'llah might possess, but rather as the, quote, inevitable outcome of the forces that have made of this present age an age infinitely more advanced, more receptive, and more insistent to receive an ampler measure of divine guidance. So once again, it is not a lessening or dwarfing of prophets of the past or of revelations of the past, something each adherent of any prior faith should be able to understand. Even within, for example, as I gave the example with uh, Judaism in the past, um, even when we look at Hinduism, did or did not, from a Hindu perspective, Brahman or manifest himself in the form of Vishnu in the temple of Krishna or Rama previously? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, the divine has actually revealed itself in many ways. And has that actual revelation unto humankind actually been increasing and giving us a richer picture? I would argue that in Hinduism it does. That actually when we move from Vedic understandings to an understanding of the Upanishads or the Gita, we get a fuller, fuller understanding of the divine. Does that mean that the Vedas themselves are actually dwarfed, belittled, or rejected? No, it's actually... That was the earlier stage of the education of the peoples in that region of the world. And that the revelation that was sent unto them was actually suited to their capacity as any educator would unto their students. Follow thou the way of thy Lord, and say not that which the ears cannot bear to hear. For such speech is like luscious food given to small children. 
however palatable, rare and rich the food may be. It cannot be assimilated by the digestive organs of a suckling child. Therefore, unto everyone who hath the right, let his settled measure be given. Not everything that a man knoweth can be disclosed, nor can everything that he can disclose be regarded as timely, nor can every timely utterance be considered as suited to the capacity of those who hear it. Such is the consummate wisdom to be observed in thy pursuits. Be not oblivious thereof, if thou wishest to be a man of action under all conditions. First diagnose a disease and identify the malady, then prescribe the remedy, for such is the perfect method of the skillful physician. So in this quote, uh, which is from the selections of the writings of Abdu'l-Baha, also includes a quote, he is actually quoting Baha'u'llah in the second section. And he gives us an example of giving food to a child which they cannot digest. Giving something to a person that they cannot properly process. And then he quotes uh, Baha'u'llah. Not everything a man knoweth can be disclosed, nor can everything that he disclosed be regarded as timely, nor considered suited to the capacity of those who hear it. Once again, this notion of health or education. And in each case, that that which has to be given is what is suited to the capacity of the individual or group that one is communicating with, or feeding, or giving a remedy unto. And we actually hear passages like this, for example, in the New Testament, that actually we cannot give meat to a child, right? That we actually, there are things that we cannot yet bear to hear, but will be revealed in the future. Um, and this was in no way in the statements of Jesus Christ, or any of the prophets of the past, a statement that they couldn't reveal it, but rather that it was not timely, or suited to the capacity of those who are listening. So the next quote is actually a longer quote, once again from the World Order of Baha'u'llah, which we will take in sections. Nor does the Baha'i Revelation, claiming as it does to be the culmination of a prophetic cycle and the fulfillment of the promise of all ages, attempt, under any circumstances, to invalidate those first and everlasting principles that animate and underlie the religion that have preceded it. The God-given authority vested in each one of them, it admits and establishes as its firmest and ultimate basis. So here Shoghi Effendi says that the Baha'i Revelation does not attempt to invalidate those first and everlasting principles that animate and underlie the religions that have preceded it. That it is not trying to take away the fundamental essential capacities and expressions of humankind's relationship with the divine or his finding of the sacred beloved. It regards them in no other light except as different stages in the eternal history and constant evolution of one religion, divine and indivisible, of which it itself forms but an integral part. It neither seeks to obscure their divine origin, nor to dwarf the admitted magnitude of their colossal achievements. It can countenance no attempt that seeks to distort their features, or to stullify the truths which they instill. So the Baha'i Faith views prior religions as, quote, different stages in the eternal history and constant evolution of one religion. This is um, a facet of the Baha'i faith that often isn't properly understood. Uh, Baha'is, in my understanding, um, the Baha'i faith does not see that there are many, many religions on the face of our earth. It sees them as chapters or expressions of one fundamental religion, which has been, as if you will, a divine gardener, cultivating all the different regions of one property, if you will, to create them into one exquisite garden, into one exquisite, beautiful, flowering place. A fragrant and luscious and nutritious place. And that it seeks to neither, to quote, to obscure their divine origin, nor to dwarf the admitted magnitude of their colossal achievements. 
So the Baha'i faith really seeks not only to recognize the, quote, colossal achievements that these previous revelations have actually achieved, but even to actually bring them to a fuller expression by placing them within their historical, social, and intellectual context. To really see that while we might see a stage as backward, viewing it from a much later stage, if we see it within its context, we can find that it is actually rather pivotal, and in fact vital to humankind's development. We return again to the same notion that you know, simple mathematics, multiplication, you know what I mean? Subtraction, addition, right? These things may seem to someone who has actually advanced in mathematics as simple, not, not worthy of attention. And they aren't in some cases when you yourself are a mathematician or you're working within physics, but they are vital to your understanding of where you stand now. They are pivotal to the development of the human mind. Its teachings do not deviate a hairbreadth from the verities they enshrine, nor does the weight of its message detract one jot or one tittle from the influence they exert or the loyalty they inspire. Here the Guardian states that the Bifaith's teachings do not deviate a hair's breadth from the verities they enshrine, they do not detract from their message, or from the influence they exert, or the loyalty they inspire. And this is often hard to see, because an individual from a, for example, Jewish perspective, sees a Christian as actually abandoning, turning away from, and if you will, even disparaging Moses. But from a Christian perspective, no, they are actually seeing the true fruit of what Moses had actually laid down. And again, from a Jewish perspective, to actually have followed Isaiah or Ezekiel, um, to do so would be to see what it was that Moses was doing, or returning us back to the true expression of the Mosaic dispensation. And even so, the loyalty that they inspire is actually extended. Um, I would argue, from a Christian perspective, and actually Abdu Baha makes this argument in uh, Promulgation of Universal Peace, where actually the teachings of Moses, his name and his influence, has been spread throughout the world to a, greater, to a greater degree by Jesus than by the Jewish population themselves. And I would argue the same principle actually goes for Islam and Christianity and Judaism that it has actually been a greater expression, a greater expanse of the very name of Jesus Christ. Even if one still contends that they are irreconcilable, that name was voiced throughout the rest of the world, not by Christian missionaries, but rather by Muslims. Far from aiming at the overthrow of the spiritual foundation of the world's religious systems, its avowed, its unalterable purpose is to widen their basis to restate their fundamentals, to reconcile their aims, to reinvigorate their life, to demonstrate their oneness, to restore the pristine purity of their teachings, to coordinate their functions, and to assist in the realization of their highest aspirations. These divinely revealed religions, as a close observer has graphically expressed it, are doomed not to die, but to be reborn. Does not the child succumb in the youth, and the youth in the man? Yet neither child nor youth perishes. There is so much stated in this quote, or this section of the quote, by the Guardian. He states that the Baha'i Faith is to widen the basis of previous revelations, to restate their fundamentals, reconcile their aims, reinvigorate their life, demonstrate their oneness, restore the pristine purity, coordinate their functions, and assist in the realization of their highest aspirations. That's a mouthful. <laughs> There's a, a great deal to actually be talked about in this quote. Um, what we see is that the Baha'i faith, true or not, <laughs> is actually stating that it is attempting to restate the fundamental sacred principles of prior dispensations. 
trying to reconcile their aims by seeing them in a larger context, to reinvigorate their life and bring people back to understand the true beauty of actually these dispensations, these expressions and manifestations of God's will, by showing how they played a role in the continuing development and raising up of humankind. It is even to restore their pristine purity and coordinate their functions and assist in the realization of their aims. I believe that we can see when we truly look at these revelations of God, these manifestations of the will and love of the Divine Friend, that much of the original teachings and the original purpose has become obscured through the dust of history, through contentious and often divisive battles within the revelations, for example, within Christian denominations or sects, or Islamic legal schools, or Islamic sects and denominations, same with Buddhist and Hindu. In fact, this part, as we will return to this in the future, is something that can't actually be denied by any adherent of any of these faiths, because there is such a difference in how these different denominations and sects really see this revelation. That the Baha'i faith is to at one, restate their pristine teachings, return to their fundamentals, place them in their context, and enable us to have a deeper understanding of how one revelation was actually intimately interconnected with another, and thus widen their basis, expand the scope of one's loyalty, instead of reducing or removing one's loyalty and adoration for a specific revelation. I would even suggest as well that even these debates and sometimes divisions that occurred within, say, the Christian Church or the Islamic community, that it's important to, even in this front, empathize and understand the individuals and the players involved. That at times, as uh, really as sad as some of these were, that there were players who were attempting, to the best of their ability, to save the faith that they saw as truly beautiful, sacred, and divine. At times, these might have been far more extreme than they ever should have been. Um, and I think that by going back and even understanding the different expressions of creeds and dogmas, we can find light through the clouds. They who are the luminaries of truth and the mirrors reflecting the light of divine unity Baha'u'llah explains in the Kitab i Yagon. In whatever age and cycle they are sent down from their invisible habitations of ancient glory unto this world to educate the souls of men and endue with grace all created things, are invariably endowed with an all-compelling power and invested with invincible sovereignty. These sanctified mirrors, these day springs of ancient glory, are one and all the exponents on earth of him who is the central orb of the universe, its, its essence and ultimate purpose. From him proceed their knowledge and power. From him is derived their sovereignty. The beauty of their countenance is but a reflection of his image, and their revelation a sign of his deathless glory. Through them is transmitted a grace that is infinite, and by them is revealed the light that can never fade. Human tongue can never be fittingly sing their praise, and human speech can never unfold their mystery. Inasmuch as these birds of the celestial throne, he adds, are all sent down from the heaven of the will of God, and as they all arise to proclaim his irresistible face, they therefore are regarded as one soul, and the same person. They all abide in the same tabernacle, soar in the same heaven, are seated upon the same throne, utter the same speech, and proclaim the same face. They only differ in the intensity of their revelation and the comparative potency of their light. That a certain attribute of God hath not been outwardly manifested by these essences of detachment, doth in no wise imply that they who are the daysprings of God's attributes 
and the treasuries of his holy names did not actually possess it. In this section of the quote from the World Order of Baha'u'llah, Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, uh, quotes Baha'u'llah in the text. And there are several aspects of it that I think really need to be taken note of. One is this section where it says, when speaking of these sanctified mirrors, these day springs of ancient glory, are one and all the exponents on earth of him who is the central orb of the universe, its essence and ultimate purpose. That it continues, the beauty of their countenance is but a reflection of his image and their revelation a sign of his deathless glory. Very often within interfaith dialogue, it is seen that from a Baha'i perspective, we actually believe in someone other than Jesus. Or for example, someone other than Krishna, or other than the Buddha. And yet, true or not, <laughs> that's for the investigation, the quotes within the Baha'i faith state that each of these are exponents, or a countenance of, a reflection of, this one central orb. And I believe when we look, for example, again in the New Testament, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, that it is actually the Word of God that is actually being reflected in the image of these physical temples. As a quick aside, um, when you read actually the beginning of the Gospel of John in the New Testament, you see that in the beginning was the Word, but Jesus Christ, the physical temple and expression of divinity within the New Testament, in the dispensation of Christ, was actually obviously far, far after. <laughs> Yet that being was seen as a reflection of his deathless glory, an image, their revelation, a sign of him. So what a Baha'i, in my understanding, sees as a manifestation of God is really a expression, a historical expression and communication of the divine being to humankind in the form of a human temple. This is why Baha'u'llah adds, all are sent down from the heaven of the will of God, and they all arise to proclaim his irresistible faith. They therefore are regarded as one soul and the same person. This is why, as we have seen previously, that if a certain attribute is manifested in one of these divine revelations, if a certain facet of the divine nature, or even a certain facet of that divine being, the reality of a manifestation of God, is only outwardly expressed in that dispensation, that it, quote, doth in no wise imply that they who are the day springs of God's attributes and the treasuries of his holy names did not actually possess it. This again relates to the nature of a teacher. If I am teaching an individual my one of my martial arts, for example, when I'm doing so, when I'm teaching them something very fundamental, it doesn't mean I don't possess what I teach to my advanced students. If my music teacher is teaching me something, and it is a certain facet of the musical, wonderful world of music, it doesn't mean that he doesn't possess what another teacher would teach me. It simply means that that is not the time nor place for the expression of that quality. And I think as well, we can understand that to many people in our own lives, we are different people. We share different aspects of ourself. To those who are intimate and those who stay around us, they get to see a lot more of who we are. And again, this is a decent analogy for how I as a Baha'i see the Baha'i revelation, if you will, the eternal covenant between God and humankind. It's that if you had been around for millennia and had actually stayed with the light of God's communication, as opposed to the lamp, 
which is the physical expression of it, you would come to know much more the beauty of that divine being, because it is as if he has sent you letter after letter after letter. I know myself once when I asked my own teacher of the Baha'i Faith, um, what is your scripture? Like, well, like, where is Baha'i scripture? And I'll never forget this, actually, because he brought out uh, the Bible. And he put it down and he said, uh, do you realize that this is not just one book? I was raised in a Catholic family, so I said, well, of course I do. It's many, many books. And he said, and it is seen as being two dispensations, if you will, that of Moses and that of Jesus Christ. I said, yeah, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament as said by Christians. And he said, but there's actually book after book after book in here. I said, yeah, and they're just, yeah, I guess they're bound together. But then he brought out the Quran, the writings of the Buddha. He brought out Hindu writings. And he also brought out the writings of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. That when I was sitting there, I was thinking, well, one, that's just a massive corpus. But also, it was this image of love letters. Um, the idea that if my beloved had actually shared with me or my parent had shared with me a series of letters expressing themselves to me, that if I only read one of them, I would actually miss out a great deal on the real richness of the character of my beloved. And I would offer this as an analogy for how we can see the different divine religions of humankind's collective spiritual history. It should also be borne in mind that Great as it is, as is the power manifested by this revelation, and however vast the range of the dispensation its author has inaugurated, it emphatically repudiates the claim to be regarded as the final revelation of God's will and purpose for mankind. To hold such a conception of its character and functions would be tantamount to a betrayal of its cause and a denial of its truth. It must necessarily conflict with the fundamental principle which constitutes the bedrock of Baha'i belief. The principle that religious truth is not absolute but relative, that divine revelation is orderly, continuous, and progressive, and not spasmodic or final. Indeed, the categorical rejection by the followers of the faith of Baha'u'llah of the claim to fin finality which any religious system inaugurated by the prophets of the past may advance, is as clear and emphatic as their own refusal to claim that same finality for the revelation with which they stand identified. To believe that all revelation is ended, that the portals of divine mercy are closed, that from the day springs of eternal holiness no sun shall rise again, that the ocean of everlasting bounty is forever stilled, and that out of the tabernacle of ancient glory the messengers of God have ceased to be made manifest, must constitute in the eyes of every follower of the faith a grave and inexcusable departure from one of its most cherished and fundamental principles. In here, in this quote, Shoghi Effendi, again, in the World Order of Baha'u'llah, states that the Baha'i Faith, quote, repudiates the claim to be regarded as the final revelation of God's will and purpose for mankind. It is not that Baha'u'llah is the end. From a Baha'i perspective, there won't be an end. As long as there are conscious beings who can actually seek out the mysteries of the universe, delve into moral realities, and can have a relationship with their Creator, there is revelations of God. That, as well, to state this would be, quote, tantamount to a betrayal of its cause and a denial of its truth. Then it states that the fundamental principle which constitutes the bedrock of Baha'i belief, the be principle that religious truth is not absolute but relative, the divine revelation is orderly, continuous, and progressive, not spasmodic and final. And I think that, as he says, it would be 
an inexcusable departure from one of its most cherished and fundamental principles. Now then, the idea, again from my understanding, um, that the Baha'i faith teaches that spiritual truth is relative, not final, is not relativism. It's not actually stating that any individual who has any perspective is therefore necessarily true. No, it's really in the context of many of the analogies that we have already looked at. That when an individual is actually sharing knowledge with another, be they a teacher of music, mathematics, science, language, linguistics, history, and any of these, it is that we are having an expression of a series of truths to the degree and capacity of the student themselves. That mathematical truths taught in the beginning, which may have to be understood more fully, um, does not mean that while it is relative and progressive, it does not mean that former truths are false. It does not mean that these are partial true, no, sorry, that does not mean that they are relative truths, but they can at times be partial expressions of a greater truth, and that they are consecutive, that there is a development not spasmodic and not final, that humankind has been under the tutelage of one divine being that has expressed itself unto humankind in various different ways in trying to slowly meet cultures and communities and individuals at the stage that they are at and bring them up together so that if as they came closer to the source they could be united. Another analogy can be used for this um, relative and progressive versus absolute and spasmodic is the idea of the difference between someone coming up and you're building a building and saying that anything is a building. <laughs> Um, by this I mean, when one is laying the foundations of a building, it is for there to be erected further stages on it in a progressive degree, a further, all the way to its full and complete ornamentation, which Baha'is believe will never happen. <laughs> um, rather than saying, I'm laying the foundations, and a person comes up and asks me and says, well, what are you doing? And I say, well, I'm actually, this is a building, or we're making, this is a house. Right? And then a person looking over their garden and saying, yes, I have a house too. That would be a notion of relativism rather as relative. Relative to its time, relative to its place, and relative to the capacity of an individual. Far from wishing to add to the number of the religious systems whose conflicting loyalties have for so many generations disturbed the peace of mankind, this faith is instilling into each of its adherents a new love for and a genuine appreciation of the, un of the unity underlying the various religions represented within its pale. In the first section of this quote, Shoghi Effendi says, that we are not wishing to add to the number of the religious systems, um, but rather instilling in the adherents a new love for genuine appreciation of, the, appreciation of the unity underlying the various religions represented within its pale. That from a Baha'i's perspective, um, there is not, again, not a multiplicity of religions, but a multiplicity of letters from one's creator, enabling individuals and communities to understand a facet if you will, of the divine being. This again can be understood. Um, how else would a Hindu understand the expression through the Vedas, through, for example, the Upanishads, through things like the Gita or the Puranas, rather than but additional expressions of the divine? How else would a Jewish individual understand the Old Testament, a collection of numerous books? other than seeing them as not adding another religion or another revelation, but seeing them as a continuous expression over time to the relative degree and understanding of the individuals, a remedy tailored to their time and place. The same goes for a Christian or a Muslim. 
Again, um, even within Islam, which many people believe refutes the authenticity of the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, it does not. And I ask you to please actually look at the video on this site about the authenticity of the Bible in the Old Testament, or the, the Tanakh, um, from the Quran itself. It really is seeing an interdependence of these different revelations, not a diminution of any one given faith. That really when we actually look at the Baha'i writings, it is usually, if one really becomes familiar with the writings, it is an apparent over-exaltation of the station of these religions from both the perspectives of the adherents and also the secular world. Because the Baha'i faith is seeing them as the founders of these faiths, as being seemingly greater than many of the adherents themselves, but also seeing these revelations as beautiful and exquisite because we're seeing them as placed within the historical context and social context in which they were revealed. These are, in the end, the various stages of one educator, the various cultivations and prudings of one divine gardener. While preserving their patriotism and safeguarding their lesser loyalties, it has made them lovers of mankind and the determined upholders of its best and truest interests. While maintaining intact their belief in the divine origin of their respective religions, it has enabled them to visualize the underlying purpose of these religions, to discover their merits, to recognize their sequence, their interdependence, their wholeness and unity, and to acknowledge the bond that vitally links them to itself. This universal, this transcending love which the followers of the Baha'i Faith feel for their fellow men, of whatever race, creed, class, or nation, is neither mysterious nor can it be said to have been artificially sim stimulated. It is both spontaneous and genuine. They whose hearts are warmed by the energizing influence of God's creative love cherish his creatures for his sake and recognize in every human face a sign of his reflected glory. Though loyal to their respective governments, though profoundly interested in anything that affects their security and welfare, though anxious to share in whatever promotes their best interests, the faith with which the followers of Baha'u'llah stand identified is one which they firmly believe God has raised high above the storms, the divisions, and controversies of the political arena. Their faith they conceive to be essentially non-political, supranational in character, rigidly non-partisan, and entirely dissociated from nationalistic ambitions, pursuits, and purposes. Such a faith knows no division of class or of party. It subordinates, without hesitation or equivocation, every particularistic interest, be it personal, regional, or national, to the paramount interests of humanity, firmly convinced that in a world of interdependent peoples and nations, the advantage of the part is best to be reached by the advantage of the whole and that no abiding benefit can be conferred upon the component parts if the general interests of the entity itself are ignored or neglected. Their faith, Baha'is firmly believe, is moreover undenominational, non-sectarian, and wholly divorced from every ecclesiastical system, whatever its form, origin, or activities. No ecclesiastical organization, with its creeds, its traditions, its limitations, and exclusive outlook, can be said, as is the case with all existing political factions, parties, systems, and programs, to conform, in all its aspects, to the cardinal tenets of Baha'i belief, to some of the principles and ideals animating political and ecclesiastical institutions 
Every conscientious follower of the faith of Baha'u'llah can, no doubt, readily subscribe. With none of these institutions, however, can he identify himself, nor can he unreservedly endorse the creeds, the principles, and programs on which they are based. I included the section of this quote regarding politics because I believe it's an analogy for how Baha'is see the unity of religion just as they see the unity of the political sphere. In the second section, and please see uh, the political deepening here on Bridging Beliefs on Baha'i Politics, it states that the Baha'i faith is undenominational, non-sectarian, divorced from every ecclesiastical system because all Baha'i representatives are actually elected in a universal suffrage. It states that no ecclesiastical organization with its trades, creeds, traditions, limitations, and exclusive outlook can be said, as is the case with all existing political factions, party systems, and programs, to conform to the cardinal tenets of the Baha'i faith. Um, it's stating that just as in the political realm, a Baha'i does not weigh in on um, whether it be conservative or liberal, or a perspective of, say, the Democratic Party or the Reform Party, that it is actually truly representing what a Baha'i believes. But actually, the Baha'i faith, from my understanding, can actually see so many actual, if you will, beautiful gems within each of these traditions. Oftentimes, again speaking for myself, I see facets of Catholic theology or Catholic doctrine as beautiful. I see aspects of Protestantism as beautiful. I see certain aspects of the theology of the Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox Church as exquisite. Yet the Baha'i Faith does not actually conform particularly to any of them. So it's the same in both the political and religious sphere. With none of these institutions, the quote ends, however, can he identify himself, nor can he unreservedly endorse the creeds, the principles, and programs on which they are based. I might myself be able to understand why at a certain stage of humanity, the, the institute of even a hereditary priesthood might have actually been a useful social institution for carrying forth the intellectual and scribal arts. But to see it as actually tailored for the day in which we live, I, I cannot agree. Um, we do not try to actually brush away all these things, but seek to understand, in our view, what has been within its social context. What we're trying to do is to understand not simply what the Baha'i Faith is saying in this day, but because it is to enable the adherent of each faith to understand the fundamental purpose and have a deeper devotion for the religion with which they stand identified, a previous quote from the Guardian, that we're trying to understand what has been revealed in this day in the context of the familiar. That we're trying to see what really the purpose of these revelations of God to humankind were truly, truly for. And it's just that at times, if we take them out of their societal context, if we take them out of their social context, we're trying to use categories that don't properly apply. It's like trying to understand, if you will, a jellyfish through the categories of mammal and reptile. <laughs> we need a broader understanding of the biological world to see how they relate and even to see, if you will, their common ancestors. 